Seabiscuit did just what I thought he'd do, Pollard told a columnist the next day. He made a rear admiral out of war admiral. When it came time, a few weeks later, for reporters to cast their ballots for Horse of the Year, there was no debate over which one deserved the honor. The Biscuit, sports writer Bill Corum wrote, turns out to be the kind that Mama used to make. Just six weeks later, Seabiscuit's career seemed over. On February 14th, 1939, as he swung around the final turn of a prep race at Santa Anita, Seabiscuit stumbled, his left foreleg suddenly giving way. His suspensory ligament had been ruptured. It was likely that he would never run again. Howard was crushed, but he refused to use the word retirement. He took his horse home to his California ranch for what he called a nice long rest. In April, Pollard arrived with Agnes. He was flat broke and had no home to offer his new wife. Graciously, the Howards took them in. For a third time, his leg had been broken and reset. He hobbled along now and drank to dull the pain. Seabiscuit and I were a couple of old cripples together, Pollard later said, all washed up. Throughout the summer of 1939, horse and jockey convalesced together, taking long limping walks, pushing a little farther each day. By September, they were up to five miles. Out there among the hooting owls, Pollard later remembered, we both got sound again. I think that my father found a solace in watching this horse come back and grow strong. And I think in some ways, well, Seabiscuit became his role model in a way, you know. And if he can do it, I can, you know, kind of thing. Late that fall, Charles Howard made an extraordinary announcement. On March 2nd, 1940, seven-year-old Seabiscuit would take one last stab at the race that had so far eluded him, Santa Anita's 100 grander. But there was no mention of who would be in the saddle. If Red breaks that leg again, Howard said, he'll be crippled for life. Still, Pollard insisted he was fit enough to ride. Old Pops and I have four good legs between us, he told a close friend. Maybe that's enough. On race day, Red came into the paddock just before four o'clock. Around his neck hung a medal of St. Christopher that Agnes had given him for luck. He wasn't too proud to admit he needed it. Eyes of the turf world are on Santa Anita in the comeback of the great Sea Biscuit. Twice he's lost the $100,000 handicap by a nose. Now if those valuable pins can stand the gaff today, he'll try again. As Smith hoisted him into the saddle, Pollard felt his confidence return. You know the horse, and the horse knows you, Smith whispered. Bring him home. For Pollard, it would all come down to that. Exactly one minute and 36 seconds after the bell rang, he found himself bottled up with sea biscuits straining at the reins. There was no way around the front runners. Finally, at the far turn, a lane opened barely wide enough for the horse to get through. Pollard leaned forward in the saddle and shouted, now pop. At the touch of the whip, Seabiscuit broke through and exploded into the lead. He and Pollard scorched down the stretch and under the wire, all alone. Seabiscuit had clocked the fastest mile and a quarter in Santa Anita's history, the second fastest ever run on an American track and had surpassed the world money-winning record by more than $60,000.
Some called it the greatest comeback in the history of American sports. Oh, wrote columnist Jolly Roger, that I have lived to see this day. In the winner's circle, Pollard sat straight-backed on his horse, his red hair matted with sweat. Beneath him, Seabiscuit was still, calmly munching the flowers from his victory wreath as dozens of camera bulbs flashed. Don't think, Pollard said later, he didn't know he was the hero. He suffered career-ending injuries and surmounted them. He ran until a very advanced age. And he was ridden by a jockey who suffered calamitous accidents, who somehow pulled himself together, two crippled old men, to go out in a blaze of glory and do great things. And to a depression-ridden, anxious, frightened nation, it must have come like, like a great sunrise. I think my father understood that it was just by chance that he became famous. So many millions have talent uh, or beauty, and they haven't been in the right place at the right time, and they haven't drifted into, you know, an arena uh, where they could be appreciated. Uh, I think he knew that very deeply, uh, that it was all luck. I think that together, Seabiscuit and he made a whole comet, a star, a ball of light. There is something quintessentially American about everyone in this story and about the ability to triumph over hardship. That's the journey. That's the journey toward the American dream. This country was built on that. And he embodies that more than anybody else. He, he is an extraordinary story that way.